Aloha and welcome to Stan the Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. Dan Osterman coming to you live and direct from Kailua on the island of Oahu, on the island chain of Hawaii, state of Hawaii. Wow, it's been a busy, busy year this year with energy, but it's also been a very, very complicated year. And if you got a chance to check out the title, We're Gambling with Oil, you're probably scratching your head and going, eh, how do I put those pieces together? Um, the last few months, I've been talking a lot about how the energy world is tied to our, our economic realities in our world. And one of the absolute laws in economics is supply and demand, the law of supply and demand. Now, if you're a person into science and, and those kind of things, you understand that when you have a law, it means it always holds true. In science, we have theories and we, we put, post, we put uh, postulized thought together and say, I have a theory. I've gathered a whole bunch of data. And if this happens and this happens, then therefore this will happen. But that theory doesn't become law until it actually happens all the time, 100% without failure. So when the economists use the term supply and demand, they really mean it's a law. It happens without fail. But just like everything else in the world, things can be manipulated, things can be worked with, things can be changed, altered, little deception, a little bit of lies here and there, whatever. And it can distort how you get a result, even when you're dealing with a law. So how does oil and gambling tied together. And it gets back to the fact that most of the economics in today's world, uh, a big proportion of them have to do with risk. And if you know anything about gambling, it's all about risk and managing risk and taking chances and having a certain amount of information and understanding what it is and being willing to take a chance and bet either bluff like in poker or increase your your bet or whatever and see if you can if you can win so in the big world if you've taken some of my last few shows into heart you understand that energy and money are so tied together with u.s reserve currency or the world's reserve currency being the u.s dollar that countries as they develop their foreign policy and, and put things into place, how they deal with other countries, it's all about managing risk. If you're a military guy, you understand the strategic level of war is all about measuring risk and deciding when to take a chance and deciding whether you not you believe what data you're getting before you take risk. So the oil world and the rest of the economic world that we're facing today if you haven't been living under a rock for the last couple months, understand that our world is heading into a really, really unusual place. I would go so far as to say that I don't think we've faced the potential for economic disaster of the scale since the 1920s. Um, and that was a pretty monstrous depression um, right before World War II. And I say that because we have been we have had a history of people gambling with the economics of energy and detaching themselves from the reality that energy is so crucial in our society today we don't actually connect the two and we take a lot more risk than we probably should so i've been looking at a periodical online called oilprice.com and they have some really good articles and I got turned on to this site by Mr. Dan Gowen who's one of my regular guests and one of the interesting things that caught my eye was a, a, a top topic called demand destruction is delaying an oil supply crisis and I went demand destruction oil supply crisis this whole supply and demand thing came back into focus and I went but how, did, how does that, I just don't understand where the, the demand destruction is coming in. So, I mean, I can see that, that we're all worried about Russia, you know, holding back exports of oil 
and driving the price, you know, by by limiting oil exports and keeping demand high. But this demand destruction didn't connect until I started really reading the article and thinking about it. The demand destruction is not in Russia. It's not in the U.S. It's in China. It's in places where the Chinese government has locked down cities to the tunes of millions of people and their economies and their world is basically stopped. And when you have a society that's stopped, you have demand for energy that is stopped. You have demand for food that is stopped. You have serious, serious social implications. And then you tie the two together. Okay, well, China is is leveraging this on their own population because of COVID outbreaks, and they're locking down their communities, locking down big cities, and some communities outside of big cities. How does that really impact this whole thing, especially vis-a-vis Russia? And you say, well, Russia is also drawing back on their production. So Russia is cutting back on supply of oil to the world, sort of. They're actually storing a bunch, we think. And when they sell it, they'll be selling it at a premium price because they're keeping the, the supply low. And that would normally be a disaster if China was full up and running because China would buy all the oil that that uh, Germany, I mean, that Russia could produce. But China's not buying it. So the world is in a weird state where we have countries cooperating and betting and gambling with oil. Another thing they're gambling on, if you've been watching Standard Energy Man for the last couple of months, is that that oil is almost always tied to the U.S. dollar. Almost all the transactions worldwide for commodities is traded with the U.S. dollar. But what has happened insidiously over the last couple of years is that some countries have been slowly pulling their economy out of the need for dollars. And we talked about that last week with Dan Goen on um, Russia with almost 20, over 20 percent of their currency reserves in pure gold, where the U.S. is not on a gold standard anymore. And a new um, banking system has been set up between Russia and China, where Russia is now demanding payment in in rubles, which nobody owns a whole bunch of rubles. Everybody, every country around the world has a reserve of, of uh, dollars. But Russia and China and Iran and a couple other countries and a growing number of countries are starting to look at trading in Chinese yuan or in gold or setting up their banking system to run where they don't need to have dollars. At the same time, they're divesting themselves of dollars and tra- treasury bonds. And what that does when they dump those bonds on the market is it devalues our currency more. So you can see where this is turning into the kind of foreign policies that countries make can have effects years down the road, and it can be very disastrous. So one of the questions that um, that we have that we had come in actually is how did the U.S. and the EU end up in this serious game with Russia where they they may not be using our currency or the EU's currency anymore, and they're controlling the market on oil because you know, everybody's or a lot of people, especially in Europe, are buying uh, Russian oil. Even the United States up until recently was buying Russian oil to the point where the world is technically dependent on Russian oil. And if you're dependent on Russian oil, supply and demand kicks in, price goes higher. So here's what happened. The United States and the EU have been very trusting of China and very trusting of russia and they've shared technology and they've negotiated nice business contracts and business dealings so that we can open our we can give them um money to to manufacture things for us especially in china and they'll open their markets to u.s goods you know all those nice trade deals that we have unfortunately when you don't pay attention close attention to all those deals 
when somebody pulls the rug out from under those deals, you can find yourself in a really serious problem. For example, one of these demand destruction issues is that Russia is no longer pumping natural gas into Poland and Bulgaria. That's a big deal. It's just now getting to the end of winter time. Spring is starting to come on board. But that kind of thing can shut down not only their household heating and cooking, but their whole economy. So Russia, in not just invading Ukraine, but in working their own policies and their own economic policies and their own currency designs in their own banking system, have basically been going on rapidly for probably 10 years. And nobody has noticed the change. Maybe we weren't paying attention. Maybe we we're paying attention and we just didn't care. We thought we were too big to, to fail, just like all the big banks in early, you know, early 2000s, too big to fail till you have a bubble and the bubble bursts. Internationally, we're really close to having a US dollar bubble burst. And we need to start paying attention and do whatever we can, which may be kind of painful for us all economically dealing with the inflation that we have and interest rates are gonna have to go up. It's gonna mean we tighten our belt, we do with less and we try and get ourselves back on track. But because we haven't been paying attention, that's what we get. Another uh, article that came out was, um, there, the folks that keep track of oil production in the U.S. say that U.S. oil production has been falling off steadily. And that's been tracked. Um, usually it's, it's tracked several months. Uh, it lags about several months. Like the, the data we have right now is from February of 2022. But be, even though that's old data, old data economically, it tends to be very accurate data and a very accurate predictor of future. And what it shows us is that America's oil reserves and natural gas reserves are tapering off, not because of any Green New Deal, not because we're all going, you know, battery cars and stuff. It's because we're not producing oil. And the fact that we shut down some of our, our oil uh, pipelines and we limited exploration and production out of other oil fields it will take us years to get back on track to to even be able to to take care of our own requirements in our country without importing from other countries so that data has shown up it's in it's in articles here and you can see it um kind of related back to what's going on with the international currency china calls out the u.s dollar dominance as it buys Russian coal with Yuan. The Chinese state media is using the situation as an opportunity to claim that the status of the US dollar as that, is at risk. When I used to be in the military, there was a paramount saying that we always, always followed. You never enter a fight without the advantage. The US has let itself decline on the world stage policy-wise, militarily, et cetera, to where other countries think that we can't defend ourselves economically or militarily. And that perception becomes their reality. It may not be true. I have great confidence in the U.S. military. But if they think that we can't hold them at, at bay, then they may try something real bold. And when you hear Vladimir Putin saying he might put his nuclear forces you know, on high alert or he may use nuclear weapons in Ukraine, that's a bold step taken because he feels he has an advantage over the Western world. And he feels that way because of the economics that he and China and those other countries I talked about have been leveraging over the last few years and the fact that he controls a big chunk of the energy that the world needs, and he can always hold those leverage as leverage. So we have to get back on our game, folks. And the, the current policy of our government is not getting us there. Another story that was brought up in, in um, the oilprice.com was 
are China and Russia teaming up to challenge the U.S. space dominance? And I thought that was a kind of an interesting story to ask or a question to ask right now at this point in time. Um, and then I realized that, yeah, China and Russia have taken so much technology, especially China has taken so much technology from the U.S., literally taken it, stolen it. Um, we they've invited companies over to China with cheap labor and and easy regulations so that they could get into our computer systems and get into our personnel and pay them off and stuff to start getting some of the um, technology that U.S. companies have worked hard for and spent a lot of money developing. And we're literally giving those away. And right now, nobody owns space. It's, it's, it's internationally agreed that there is no country that owns space. But space is becoming a very contested area, thus standing up the U.S. Space Force last year or last um, two years ago. It's important. China and Russia have been literally just playing fast and loose with space. Um, China launched uh, a, a rocket um, to go to their space station uh, about a year ago. Um, the One of the booster stages came back to Earth, and that re-entry hadn't been coordinated with anybody. Um, it actually fell to Earth, luckily, in their own territory and didn't hit anybody. But it wasn't communicated that it was coming back in at a place they hadn't planned. So the international community knew nothing about it. And when you're dealing with places like China and Russia, secrecy is great. They just don't tell anybody. And they, they deal with the issue if it becomes a problem. And China and Russia are challenging the US in space. They're challenging it with their own technology that we helped develop and gave them or let them steal from us. And the last thing we can afford to do is have other countries literally dominate space. If you don't think it's important, um, I can tell you that the GPS satellites that we have around the world don't just help us navigate. They don't, it's not just so airlines can travel with less crew members. They don't need a navigator on airplanes anymore. Um, uh, GPS can keep tracking and keeps the airplanes within literally feet of where they're supposed to be. But the timing signals for all the banking transactions in the world come off those GPS satellites. The accuracy in US military weapons to a great degree comes from GPS. We can't afford to lose dominance in space, yet we've let those other countries basically start taking it. The last part was, is China gonna try and control the global electric vehicle supply chain? Um, and there's another economic rule that comes into play. I don't think it's a law, but it's a rule. And that is first to market will gain control of the market or has the advantage in gaining control. China for years has been buying up all what we call the rare earths, all of the uh, rare earth minerals um, that they need for electric vehicles, batteries, things like that, all kind of technology, um, including nuclear technology for that matter. Um, and they've been doing it right out in the open. Nobody's challenged it. The U.S. hasn't gone to the other countries that they've offered deals to and said, hey, if China will do it, we'll do it for this much and we'll we'll take better care of you. No, we've just kind of let those things go because after all, China is our friend now. They're real, they're real nice and everything. So we'll just let China take over literally that market. Well, now as we demand electric vehicles and hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, become the, the way in transportation, um, all of a sudden we have less access to all the, the raw materials we need to dominate in those areas, thus making us dependent, again, on a foreign country, China, and specifically, for things that we need in electric vehicles. So we need to understand that the scale of oil and fossil fuels is huge for electricity and for transportation. And by letting China 
go and buy up all the rare earth mines and stuff around the world in different countries and control them. And with Russia controlling a bunch of the oil, the United States is losing a lot in terms of prestige, in terms of their, their um, admiration among other countries, and quite literally just in terms of our own economy. We're letting it slip away and we can't afford to do that. We have to be paying attention. So I've, I've kind of looked through some of my stuff and when I started doing my, sh my show here, I started in 2015 at the end of July. And one of the first guests that I had on was a professor from um, the Midwest called Nate Higgins. And he introduced me to a term called um, energy blindness. And at first I was kind of intrigued by that. And I was pretty much focused on hydrogen as uh, everything, hydrogen for the grid, hydrogen for transportation. I was hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. But when he said people are energy blind, I thought, hmm, as he explained it, I realized he was right on the money. Energy is not just oil. It's not just natural gas, not gasoline. It's not electricity. Energy is everything. Energy, literally, you as a human being, your dog as an animal, the plants around you, without energy, they don't exist. They're, they don't function at all. Try to go for a month without food. You'll be on a great diet. You'll probably lose weight, but you'll probably also be dead. Your body needs energy. We need energy. And today in the modern industrial world, energy has grown to be so important and we've been asleep at the wheel. We haven't been thinking about energy and the cost and the value of energy. And I came across an, an interesting quote by a gentleman named Oscar Wilde. He says, nowadays, People know the price of everything and the value of nothing. So as we have this discussion about the U.S. kind of falling behind the rest of the world, I think that's because of exactly what Oscar Wilde said. We know how much it costs for a gallon of gas, but do you value your freedom? Do you value your family? Do you value life itself? Do you value being able to have the security in your, in your own home? We have forgotten the value of the things that this country was founded on. And I think it's important that everybody wake up, start taking a personal interest in what's going on around them. Don't take things for granted. Don't listen to a bunch of rhetoric. Don't listen to the screaming BBs that the talk about the earth is, is dying, the world is going to collapse, and you got to have this law or that law, and so and so is a fascist, and so and so is a racist. Get past all that stuff and start doing your homework and start taking personal responsibility for stuff. We live in the greatest country on this planet, and it will be the greatest until we let it die. And right now, I see us letting it die, and it shouldn't die. So, anyway. We're getting really close to the end of this show. And the reason I have the slide up behind me for a background is it's a sunset. And that's because this is my last show on Think Tech Hawaii. Um, I'm still doing some other things on the outside and maybe back on the air um, from time to time. But this is my last show for Think Tech. It's been real fun. I'd like to thank everybody here at Think Tech for, for putting up with me and having a, a great, great input. Um, getting this show on the road every week for the last almost seven years. Um, it's been fun. It's been a great learning experience. I've had great guests and learned a lot from a lot of people. And I hope that uh, everybody will start taking a personal interest in energy um, at the molecular level, at the gas pump, and on their grid. And start taking to heart some of the things we've talked about on Stan Energy Man and start making a personal effort to do what's right for this planet, to do what's right for our country. So, aloha. Stan the Energy Man signing off.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.